The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. No mai hoki mai ki a The Fold, e mihine ko Duncan Grieve toku ingoa. My guest today is Paula Browning, who is the chair of an organisation which, you know, even the, the sort of hyper-informed listeners of this podcast might not necessarily have heard of. It's called We Create, and, and it's, I think, done something quite clever, which is to sort of reconceive of itself as a, a sort of an advocacy for the fundamental value and particularly the economic value of a giant raft of different sort of sectors and subsectors and what what have you that that ultimately uh, create a sort of or ladder up to to sitting under the umbrella of of the cultural and creative sectors so they include things like design advertising media film television uh, gaming fashion if you think of it and it sort of fits there it's probably in there and cumulatively Various sort of studies put this the value of the sector at around fifteen billion dollars. So, you know, th- these these numbers are always kind of hard to kind of put a precise value on. I'm sure if you did some kind of meta study that was of all of the different industries in New Zealand and the value of them to New Zealand, they would have come out a lot larger than GDP. But setting that aside, the the thing that's and you know the the galvanizing force underneath we create is I think a very important one, which is to sort of uh, get government in particular to sort of recognize the value of creative and cultural sector work and to particularly to create a a joined up coherent strategy that um, helps realize it and, and views it as an opportunity for uh, growth and for exports and for all the things that we want our economy to do in the same way that we currently do with agriculture or with tourism. And to do that, they've got a sort of a, they've got a briefing for and a request from uh, whoever might, the, the next government might be, and that's to have a, a minister to represent the cultural and creative sector, and and it's a minister, not a ministry. They're not asking for a a huge new bureaucracy there, which would inevitably overlap with some parts of MCH and MB. But just someone who can basically listen to and advocate for the the potential of the sector and try and get a sort of joined up strategy that um, that works across different aspects of government and it's a really interesting idea you know national talking about a minister for space why not something a bit more earthbound as well so that's essentially what the meat of this conversation is about we look at what the government is currently doing across a whole bunch of sectors and honestly it's kind of a mess there's parts of government that are you know in this space that are about funding specific projects and not others and there's others that are about giving big tax rebates that are really available to anyone provided they meet the criteria. There are whole other parts of the sector that just have absolutely nothing. And there are still others where not only do they have nothing, they don't even really have an economic opportunity to exploit because there is, you know, like earlier today I met with these TikTokers who have a huge audience and can't, like genuinely are starving, <laughs> like literally are not, not eating at all because there is no way to monetize these huge, huge audiences that they built up for this you know, powerful Chinese-owned technology app. And 
you know, the, the, not, none of this is an easy solve, but at least if you have a single person who kind of understands the way the whole thing operates and where there are inequities and opportunities and outdated legislation that's never enforced, if you had someone trying to patch up all that or, or you know, have a blank slate and, and redraw it, I think some pretty great things could happen. And that's certainly what uh, Paula and We Create think. And so I think this feels like quite well timed. I'm recording this ahead of the election. It's coming out just after it. But in terms of, you know, the the media, which is unavoidably contained by We Create, uh, if we sort of, you know, think about the good that it, that could be done if there were legislation drawn that was about the environment as it stands now rather than as it stood in 1989 or 1995 or whenever the relevant legislation was last put together, then maybe some good things might come with that. So that's what this discussion about. This is Paula Browning, the chair of We Create here on The Fold. Dinakwe, Paula, welcome to The Fold. Kia ora, Duncan. Lovely to be here. Um, I was just wondering if you could start by telling me about the genesis of We Create and, and sort of what, what sort of forged it. Yes, certainly. So We Create started out as the Copyright Council of New Zealand way back in the 90s um, when the Copyright Act first came into being in Aotearoa. Um, and my first connection with it was uh, when I started at Copyright Licensing New Zealand, which is the licensing agency for publishing and more recently for visual artists. Um, and by default, I became the treasurer of the Copyright Council, um, guilty of being an accountant in a previous life and uh, love a number, but no good at being an accountant. <laughs> um, and um, so we had some meetings of the Copyright Council and I'm like, as somebody who wasn't from the creative sector, I didn't quite get it why we were talking about law um, when the organisations that were represented in the Copyright Council were making these amazing things like screen productions and books and music and why were we only talking about the one piece of it? Um, so a friend of mine um, from the recorded music um, industry and I got together and went, let's see if we can convince people to do this differently and We Create was born. Um, and since then we've grown the membership to represent... Um, all of the creative industries, um, and also to make some really good connections in government with the tech sector, into arts and culture, and in education um, as well. So our members are the membership associations within each of the creative industries, so it's quite an interesting membership model. Um, so for, say, in music, Recorded Music New Zealand, APRA, Independent Music New Zealand, um, the Music Managers Forum, they're all members of ours. Um, and all of the individual creative industries have have members that uh, form part of our group. Yeah, and, and I think that's what makes it so interesting and potentially tricky, kind of trying to align the interests of like dozens of uh, quite disparate organisations. And I want to get into that. But before then, let, let's sort of drill in a bit to the copyright piece of it. What What... Well, you know, what 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 is the state of our copyright legislation and how sort of, you know, there's all kinds of challenges to copyright, you know, generative AI being the, the very kind of present current one. But, um, yeah, what is the current state of, of copyright in, in New Zealand? So the government started to look at revising or reviewing the Act in 2017 um, and there was some work done um, by um, IMBI, which is the responsible um, agency. Um, and then uh, things happened, reduced priority. Um, actually, pre-COVID, um, the review was um, was stopped. Um, I don't think it's officially off the table, but certainly nothing's been happening with it um, since then. Um, I think we, we saw... Uh, the sort of responses that you would expect, as you see around the world when copyright is reviewed, um, there are certainly sides to the argument. Um, and we also saw something that I hope if we get back to reviewing the Act, we won't see again. Um, and that, that the, the government really wasn't properly resourced um, in order to undertake such a comprehensive review. Um, they pretty much wanted to look at the entire piece of legislation. Um, where if you look at um, where 
you know, success has happened in terms of reviewing um, copyright legislation, like in Australia recently, they've broken it up into pieces and gone, okay, we're going to look at that bit, and then we'll look at that bit, and it just makes it a more um, achievable piece of, of legislative review. But the thing I'd really like us to see, um, an approach I'd like us to take when we do get back to reviewing it, is to understand the importance of it, um, and also that, you know, having legislation without enforcement is really not much use to anybody. Um, and also some power imbalances. Um, you know, your individual New Zealand author versus Google is not really a fair game. Um, and I think Kiwis like to see Kiwis get a fair chance. Um, so I'd like to see that come through the review as well. Can, can we just sort of look like with that, there's a bit of a very top line um, thing that you mentioned there, but like can we talk about some specifics of how that's expressed. So for example, like one of the, the sort of signature realities of the the internet, particularly the sort of social and user generated content internet, is that it feels like co copyright has been obliterated. That uh, a lot of what is created and shared um, through you know social platforms, in particular, which get, generates an ever larger share of audience, is either just wholesale repurposed, i.e. with very little um, added or, or subtracted from it, or um, just a sort of a, you know, taken out of context and, and put there kind of thing. You know, TikTok is full of pieces of material that are nominally under copyright to someone else that are just there, and they're almost impossible to surface if they were trying to to find them, do you just throw your, up your hands at that or is there a way that you don't blunt the kind of opportunity of those platforms but you do see fairer compensation for people who created those original works that are being repurposed? Yeah, and I think there's the, the challenge in that is when does money start to be made and then who gets to make the money? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the money gets spent in developing the technology. So obviously there's an investment there by the social media platform, but then it's just a platform without content, right? So whose content? Where does it come from? Is it, you know, in some cases you have willing participants who know what they're up for mm. um, and the content that they're putting there, that's fine. That's that's the game they want to play. I think when it is, when there's money being made and that money not, is not being fairly shared, um, then you start to see people going, well, well, why should I play there? And actually, I don't get to negotiate how I play there because, you know, there's terms and conditions that are the same for everybody. And if I want to be there and that's where my audience is or that's, you know, where my messaging sits best, um, then I don't really have a choice. Um, and that's why I, th I, mean, I think we've got more diversity now in that space than we've had before, but we certainly don't have the business models that are fair to the creator if the creator chooses that they, they want to be paid for what it is that, that's in there. And the bit that always gets me with these companies is it's technology, right? So they know exactly what's being watched, who made it, and if you wanted to, you know, with somebody with collective management experience like I've got, if you wanted to share the money out, you've got all the data you need to do it. So it's not like they can't say, oh, we don't know. They could say... Um, it's just about where the money ends up getting. And I think, you know, you're starting to have, it's not social media, but, you know, um, platforms like Spotify, you are actually starting to see conversations about, well, what is actually fair um, and making sure the creator has a stronger voice in that. Yeah, so, I mean, Spotify is becoming creator economy, even if it's not, you know, and user-generated content, even if it's not social in the same way some other platforms are. But, you know, you... There, there is an example in, in YouTube's revenue share model, which does seem to kind of actively incentivize the right things, and there are people able to make a living on it in the way that they can't really off of the likes of you know Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok in the same way. Um, you know, do you do you think that 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 kind of um, like so, some sort of regulator that forces more data sharing and, and kind of brokers more equitable agreements in that regard because the music industry for example with TikTok has has managed to kind of interact with it in a way where that's becoming a significant revenue pipeline but there isn't a you know film television other creators can't don't share in revenues uh, generated by the platform to the same extent yeah I think that 
the development of new licensing models. So we've got primary sales models, or we've got free. Yeah. And in between all of that is licensing. And what yes. does licensing look like? Um, and I don't think those models have evolved in the same way because of that power imbalance. You haven't been able to bring people to the table. And I know you're passionate about the media bargaining code and, you know, the, the mechanisms that are needed to bring, um, you know, organisations, particularly ones who aren't based here, who you can't get into a room and have a commercial conversation with. You know, what are the levers that are needed to bring them to the table? Um, or just to have a, a fair negotiation around licensing. And I think licensing is, um, you know, coming from the publishing industry, you've seen it in the ebook market as well, where libraries now license most of their content. They're not buying it, they're accessing it digitally and they're paying a license fee rather mm. than a primary sale fee. And it's actually a nice, midway is not the right number, what the right way to describe it, but it's a nice in between mechanism that means people are getting paid but you're not having to pay necessarily the same rate as you would if it was a primary sale. Um, and, it, and it solves the access issue, right, in a way that's fair for the creator. So the world gets access, but the creator gets paid if they choose to be paid. And licensing to me is pretty much the answer to everything. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm sure we'll touch on, on that again. But let's kind of go back to again to that that sort of foundation piece with, with We Create. You, you know, the some of the numbers that you talk about in a, you know you basically the reason I've got you up here there's a a briefing that you've kind of created for whoever the incoming well government is and, and a suggestion of a a new minister but um, I guess before you get to do that you have to you've got this huge your, your scale comes from having a lot of different sectors and and organisations rep represented but how do you align that you know this this very large group, which often can be arguing within it, it's it's you know amongst itself or even within an organisation to the point where you can have everyone you know agreeing on on something to, to be put down like this and, as in front of a, an incoming government. So we only operate at a sector level. Um, we don't get into either individual creative industries discussions. Um, or between the industries. Um, and we're the only organisation that plays there, so it's a, a, a space we can we can occupy. Um, and for us, which is why we've, we've put out this ask for a Minister for the Creative and Cultural Economy, it's about demonstrating value and the importance of the sector. Um, and at a sector level, and you'll see this probably even within your teams, um, it's, it's more of an ecosystem than it is an individual sector, say like dairy, um, where people move around um, in it. And, you know, you can be a media one day, book publishing the next, um, you know, next minute you're blogging for something. And it's it's not linear. So the parts of it move a lot. Um, and we've managed to make a place for ourselves where we have focused um, with very limited resource um, on being the voice to government for the value of the whole ecosystem uh, rather than the individual parts of it. Um, and that has resonated with government to an extent, particularly at an officials level. Um, it's government officials level. It's um, We've had some good traction there. Um, but the challenge that you've got when you don't have a minister and parts of your ecosystem aren't actually even represented in government um, is trying to get, um, you know, some focus and some intentionalism around what it is that uh, that we can bring, um, both the, the sector can bring to the country and to the economy in particular. Well, when you, you know, when you do speak to, uh, you know, beyond the officials to, to actually politicians themselves, what... Well, you know, is is the idea of a a minister for um, you know the creative and culture sectors? Is it a new one, and and how has it been received? You know, when when it's brought to them. Yeah, it's it would be a new portfolio, um, and the intention would it for, would be for it to have a high cabinet ranking, um, and that's to get the priority on it. 
yeah. um, so that it is absolutely seen as contributing to the country, not something that is about, um, and I don't like the F word, the funding word, I like I for investment, um, it's not something that just needs a lot of investment, that we can actually see the, the moving parts of it that actually are about export, um, that are about, um, you know, jobs and value, um, that looks a little bit different maybe than how government's used to thinking about the sector. Um, and, and that's where we think that having a minister with all of it bundled up into the one role would make a difference. We're not asking for a ministry. We're not asking for a whole new part of government to do this. Um, with a minister, what we'd want is a mandate from Cabinet for them to be able to reach into the various government agencies that have uh, work in the sector, whether that's you know foreign affairs and trade or whether it's the various parts of MB or whether it's um, Manatu Tonga. Um, there are multiple agencies that, um, as a sector that we interact with, and this minister role would provide um, some focus and a work programme across all of them. The Fold is brought to you by O-Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa, with over 4,000 out-of-home advertising sites nationwide across both street furniture and retail centres. I'm super grateful to O-Media for enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Skinny are helping you show how smart you are with the 1Q Quiz, an all-new, super-challenging and super-quick daily quiz built by The Spin-Off. Every Monday, Skinny are giving you the chance to prove you're smart with the Skinny Extra Credit question. Get it right, and you'll get the chance to score yourself some Skinny Extra mobile credit so you can text, call, or even video call your group chat and gloat about how big your brain is. T's and C's apply. In in terms of the uh, the makeup of your mem you know, member organisations, and particularly the and the scale of the the financial elements of them, the biggest one by far, which represents more than half of the the revenues, which I think are, is it around fifteen billion that that you um, ten billion of that is design alone, which. Sort of surprised me in a way, but I guess it's it's about how you sort of define that. Do you want to talk about what's inside design in particular because that is such a big number, um, and then about what the other kind of main constituent parts are? So, so you've asked about my favourite thing, numbers. <laughs> um, it's all, the numbers are just to tell a story, right? It's not all about the numbers. So the numbers that we published... Um, are the various industries numbers. Uh, the $15 billion number is a number that um, Manata Tonga, the Ministry of Culture and Heritage, um, have pulled together using infometrics. Um, and then there's the individual industry numbers that they do for themselves. Those reports are not compiled using the same methodology. Um, so the design report actually talks about the value of design to the country with where design is the design sector itself plus design that happens elsewhere in the economy. So that is an overall value of design to New Zealand, not just the design industry piece. Um, we did a similar piece of work when we went back um, in 2016 and tried to get government and have hadn't valued the sector for, for years. Um, and we got the New Zealand Institute of Economic Research to do a number. And at that stage, it came in at 17 and a half billion. But equally, that was about the value of creativity to the country. And so this can get quite woolly quite it quickly. It can get very woolly. The interesting thing, I think, from, you know, in terms of our discussion of the value of creativity to the country is a third of creative professionals work outside the creative industries. So design team at Fisher and Paykel. Um you know, it's where creativity is happening in the economy outside of the creative industries. It's also important. But the bit that obviously interests us the most is the, the core value of the sector. Um, and design is obviously a big component of that. What are the, some of the other the chunky pieces? Well, screen is the, the logical next one. Um, and again, you know, it just comes down to what you include and what, what don't you include. Big discussion in the industry at the moment, you know, if everything you consume on a screen, is that screen? Or is screen traditionally like film as it was? Does it include TV, put games in there? Um, yeah, and it, this is the challenge of being an ecosystem, right? It's got lots of moving parts. And I mean, really what we want to be able to say is it has value. And quite often, particularly when we're talking, if we're talking arts and culture, we don't necessarily think about the value um, in numeric terms as well as in the social and cultural sense. 
Um, and that's certainly where we've been trying to elevate the conversation with, particularly with government, about, you know, this stuff matters and we really need to pay more attention to it. You know, if, I, if you look at the, the sort of scale of the sectors that you represent, one thing which sort of, and, and then the way that government interacts with those various sectors, there's a shitload going on. <laughs> It's kind of a mess. <laughs> There's not like a real logic that you can say, well, if we do something this way over here in gaming, say, that we'll do it in a similar way within television and in film and in design or fashion or books. It's kind of all over the shop. And I hope I'm not being rude to <laughs> government here that it doesn't feel like if you that that there is a really strong logical reason why it's different for each sector, it's just that they were done at different times and according to a particularly persuasive argument at the time that the thing happened, and then largely, as with most things, government, you just keep doing it. Do you? What is your sort of broad sense of how those various, you know, funding, investment, rebate, uh, you know? co-working space, you know, all of that big sort of mess of interaction. Is it is it working? How you know, and how how could it be made more logical or, or is this the way it has to be? Um, I think that expression fit for purpose is a question that the government needs to ask itself in relation to being a good partner for the sector. And in, in terms of its form, at the moment, it probably isn't. And a lot of those, and, and this is nothing against the amazing people that work in those organisations because they work with what they've got from a structural perspective. Um, but we look at how the sector works now. And, I mean, it's one of the sectors that is changing the most rapidly. Um, and you need um, the government to be able to partner in a way that can keep up basically. Um, and, you know, within some organisations, there are attempts to keep up, but some of those organisations are hampered by legislation. Getting legislative change takes time. And when it comes to, you know, keeping pace with technology, licensing systems, um, you've got to be able to move fast. Um, hopefully not break things, but move fast. Um, and the government part doesn't at this, at this stage. So, you know, we'd be hoping that there's an appetite for government to... Um, reorganise itself in a way that is more fit for purpose in terms of how it works with the sector um, so that we can maximise the opportunity and things don't get, um, you know, siloed or, or locked down in, in one particular place. Um, so this, this you know, the, the ask for a minister goes along with a sort of a, a package that explains why. Mm -hmm. Do you want to sort of detail what, what's in that and, and, you know, essentially make the argument? And Yeah. Um, the why is is more about opportunity than it is about a problem. I mean, we've just talked about one thing that really is a problem. Um, but the opportunity for, um, you know, economic diversification and also for New Zealand to actually do more of something it's really good at um, as we sort of, you know, we're talking about big issues like climate change. Uh, we're talking about um, economic diversification, market diversification. We've got a bit of an issue with our trade in that sense. Um, and the ability for a small country down the bottom of the world to actually reach audiences and paying customers in all sorts of places that, of course, 30 years ago before the internet was invented, we, we couldn't do it in the same way. Um, and we haven't really had anything intentional around how the creative sector might contribute more to the economy. Um, and that's really what we're asking for. And, and again, back to sort of We Create's genesis around being a voice for the economic um, outcomes that the, the sector is, is capable of. So, I mean, we reckon we can make it to $25 billion in seven years by 2030. That's 10% year-on-year compound growth. Um, that doesn't seem like too much. I mean, who knows what it could be. Um, and, you know, that's going to take us up well beyond agriculture and, and some of the other industries at a time when that's what the country needs. Um, and, you know, it's inherently in our DNA. It's also, I think, a really massive opportunity. And I, I don't like talking about it this way, but it's the language that government uses, and that's the Māori economy. 
um, that you know the opportunity to take New Zealand's unique culture uh, to new audiences um, and and you know businesses internationally um, that also grows um, the opportunity for Māori. I think that's um, something we should absolutely be doing something about. In terms of how that gets executed, the the gaming sector you know recently had a what would must be considered a big win for the organisation in terms of the rebates which go some way to matching the and the equivalent um, sort of uh, system in Australia. Um, and there is a so, – so you have that and then you have the sort of uh, screen production rebates. Then you also have this whole other piece that is much more – about what what is comes under the, the umbrella of sort of picking winners kind of thing, where um, whether it's uh, New Zealand on Air or Te Mangai Paho or the Film Commission, you know, and and there are other equivalents um, too, where the where the government sort of hears bids and then you know you you prefer the term investment to funding, but um, but often they do, they still use the, the the term funding, but they basically wholly fund some things and don't 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 fund others at all. Is there a especially as we move into this you know sort of more more fluid um, era and area and certainly when you look internationally at how this kind of thing is typically handled, it feels like the the picking winners thing is. A little, you know, could be seen as a bit anachronistic versus the sort of more mechanistic. We we want to incentivize the growth of this area, and we'll create a, a sort of tax or, or incentive uh, wrap around that. Do, does we create have a perspective on which of those approaches it, it it thinks is more sort of efficient or more likely to achieve that that sort of regular step change growth? No, we don't. Um, you know, we, we're not a participant. In that system ourselves, um, and I think the the thing for us is the responsiveness of it, um, and being able to get a footing in being able to compete internationally in in areas where maybe we haven't been able to, or where um, like with the games rebate, um, you know we we had a great start in terms of what the industry had done for itself, but in order to get that next level of scale some action was required and that was what was was needed um, in order for that particular industry. Um, I think it's, you know, back to the point again about the the responsiveness um, and being able to, to move quickly um, and having mechanisms in there, and it's always difficult when it comes to, to government rights because the taxpayer is always looking at where the investment goes and what the value of that investment and the return was. Um, but these are all the, the sort of the roles and the industries that we're talking about. They're the jobs that we want. You know, they're the highly productive, um, highly scalable type of industries um, where they can do so much more um, when there's the right sort of wraparound mechanisms um, with them. What that looks like um, and how that would work in the individual industries. I, again, I don't think we've had a conversation about that. We keep doing similar things, but we don't sort of question whether or not it's as effective as it might be in some areas. Um, and coming from the publishing world, as I did, um, you know, there's nothing for publishing. Publishing doesn't have a home in government. Do we know what international publishing looks like? No. Does the government understand it? No. Um, and yet there's some, you know, there's amazing things that could be done. And particularly, I think, you know, we're looking very outwardly, um, especially around the export side of things. Um, and we don't have um, trade um, we don't have a trade mechanism for understanding digital trade um, or understanding what exporting digital from down the bottom of the world actually looks like um, and how we can grow that and what the support systems around that need to be either. Um, so I think yeah, th there's a conversation to be had um, and that's, again, the reason for asking for a minister is I think the industry ecosystem is ready to have that conversation. Um, the government probably needs to be coming a little bit further and you would hope to see some leadership with that minister in starting that conversation. So the, the sort of flip side of all this, 
I don't know if you read, there's a recent Matthew Houdin column in the New Zealand Herald, which um, talked about what he described as a peculiarity in New Zealand's sort of political business access where, you know, as he described it, a lot of New Zealand businesses spend an inordinate amount of time interacting with and thinking about and talking to or lobbying um, politicians for regulatory change in a way which would be sort of unimaginable in a lot of other economies. And this goes to that sort of fairly well-known uh, New Zealand initiative or taxpayers' union critique of things like the screen production uh, rebates, which is essentially that, um, you know, that, the, the because there is no tax left over or, or, or because it's basically recycling the tax revenues which, which are generated by it, that it, you know, the opportunity cost to New Zealand of having a lot of our best and brightest in that sector is, you know, such that, you know, if every sector was to behave the same way, we'd have all have great jobs and we'd have no tax revenue. That's the, That's the sort of critique of it. What is the answer of we we create to that idea that um, it, you know that it is that if there is a privileging of creative sectors and that they are given special tax treatments or, or um, that ultimately they they aren't contributing enough to to the the overall tax take of the economy? I can't say that that is a specific question that we've ever asked ourselves um, and it's not really where we get too um, involved in. I think some of that comes back to a value discussion where there's a perception that the value that is generated isn't sufficient to justify the investment in it. Um, and I think we do have an issue, a perception issue or a reality issue around how we value creativity and the creative sector. Um, and without um, somebody who came from the sports industry in the past as well, we don't question what we invest in um, in terms of sport. Um, funnily enough, they, both the funding streams come through the Ministry of Culture and Heritage. Money for sport goes out the door and nobody seems to ask any questions. And then everything that happens around the creative sector, or maybe I'm just oversensitive, seems to be like, well, why are you doing that? You know, it, it, it gets questioned to a level that I don't know that other things get questioned. Um, but, you know, we can't, as a country, be a one-show pony, right? And we, we know we can't keep relying on the stuff that we've relied on. And we just think that inherently we're good at this stuff and that we can compete. Um, and that with the, some of the issues that we've got facing us as a country now, we could pay more attention to this. And I'm not suggesting that that is, um, you know, all of the mechanisms that we currently have are right um, or that we've got the complete answer to that either because we don't. But at a, a sector level, we think that we can do better at it. And the, the bit that's missing here is not the connectedness of the sector, but it's the government piece. Um, if we look to the UK and Australia, um, Australia has a new national cultural policy called Revive. It's a whole of government approach to the sector. Um, and in the UK, um, they, it was started by a minister over there who went, right, we're going to get every government agency to consider the creative industries before they set policy. And, you know, we're going to have this massive target of growing um, creative exports. I can't remember what the number was, but it was, it was incrementally massive. Um, and they've, they've done it. Um, and it's helped them, again, economic diversification. I just don't think we look at creativity through an economic lens sufficiently um, and then understand the, the value of that in a way that helps us to have a more balanced conversation about it, not just being something we throw money at. Right. I mean, I, I guess that the sort of what, what I'm getting, because I, I see the economic argument, I guess there is just a sort of a, where I think the critique feels like it holds water is that, well, imagine that you get what you wish for, but the, that the price you pay for it is effectively making it almost like a tax-exempt 
um, part of the economy and then you actually get a different kind of problem out the other side. Does it, or to put it another way, is there a way of achieving some of what you want that doesn't require government to kind of recycle tax revenue? Like, you know, if the the amount of money that, that like, for example, what, what goes on in film in terms of the, the fact that a New Zealand on Air funded production can also uh, uh, um, now sit under the screen production rebate. Like there are some quite extraordinary levels of support there that are obviously unsustainable if you start to scale them out across different sectors of the economy. For example, could a sort of step change to a licensing regime that we're able to interact with technology companies, like could could wins like that that are fiscally neutral, say, to the, the treasury kind of, uh, you know, budgetary aspects of this, also produce major gains or will it actually ultimately come down to sort of matching or moving on the kind of rebate tax into the spectrum? God, this is, we're really in, <laughs> <laughs> we're in a particular who, area who said here, numbers we? were a good thing? Um, I, I don't think there's a country in the world that invests in culture and expects it to be fiscally neutral. And particularly for a small country with a unique culture, we are going to have to invest to some level. Um, what we found, and you know, Screen is a brilliant example of this, is what we found is when we have made those investments and we have invested in culture, that often the things that you get around that with the skills development, with the industry growth, then you've got an ability to do so much more than that. And you would hope that that there will be things that stand on their own financially um, outside of the, the cultural investment piece. And look, the, the arts and culture um, ecosystem is, you know, very much where the talent grows and, you know, where a lot of the skills and, and capability development happens. Can you, in a global market where thanks to a lot of the technology companies, the price, the starting point for stuff, for creative content, is often free. How do you make that work? Um, and that's a difficult conversation, back to the licensing thing, where, you know, it's about where's the money coming from. And if you can't make something um, for the price of what you're likely to generate from it, then you've got a gap. And if you want to have that cultural output, if you want to make that amazing creative stuff, then you've got a gap to fill. What is the best way of doing that? Pass. Um, but I think, as I said, you know, I think we need to be having a conversation and you can't do it without government in this space um, about what that looks like in 2023 and beyond because at the moment we've got mechanisms that look backwards. They don't look forwards. And as I said before, they don't respond quickly enough to how things change. So, say you get your wish, uh, <laughs> and there is a you know that this this sort of shiny new minister for you. Let's imagine that they get a couple of terms, and they're sort of looking back at you know from pretty close to that that sort of goal year of twenty thirty. What, what would the what would the, the that sort of creative uh, and cultural economy look like and what are some, you know, maybe pick two or three of the things that you could make, you think that they could, changes they could make that might have the biggest impact in terms of stepping you towards that goal? Um, I think they'd be talking about the sector um, more in economic circles, not exclusively, um, and we would stop, New Zealand would have stopped questioning the value of investing in arts, culture and creativity. Um, we'd have reached our goal of $25 billion of um, of earnings and a lot of that would be coming from digital exports. So we'd be doing our bit to contribute to um, a more climate-friendly um, economy. Um, and, yeah, I mean, uh, my, my personal hope, don't quote what we create on this one, <laughs> is that New Zealanders would inherently value creativity in the same way as they do sport and we wouldn't be questioning um, the investment or the support um, uh, that goes into it, um, and we would be 
um, absolutely as excited about international success of our creativity in the same way as we do when our sports teams win when they're offshore. That's a pretty, uh, pretty exciting and noble goal. Thank you so much for coming on the fold today, Paula, and, and talking us through that. And uh, good luck with that, that quest to just get a cheeky minister <laughs> out for your sectors. It's been great to be here. Thanks a lot, Duncan. That was The Fold, brought to you by our partners at O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Huge thanks to O Media for sponsoring this episode of The Fold and enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Talo for Lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spin Off. If you have the means, consider supporting our high-quality journalism by becoming a Spinoff member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spinoff Podcast Network.